everyone. Real joy to be here uh, this evening with Deputy Minister of Health and Chief Medical Officer for Liberia, Dr. Francis Kofak, and also to introduce to you what has been happening over in Liberia. Sometimes you, what you read in the media, especially international media, isn't necessarily what's happening, and vice versa. And now tonight, you have an opportunity to ask some questions and get the juicy details. <laughs> I'm Marge Rattel. I'm the president of Corley Green Science Foundation. And it is a joy to have brought Francis in to be with us for a few days and to share how things have continued with Ebola. Our second purpose is to say thank you. And this evening, we're going to be acknowledging a number of people and companies that have supported us through the Ebola crisis. In fact, today, Dr. Katak and, uh, and other members of our board traveled around the Lower Mainland, and we were thanking Steve Sandberry, Diamond Delivery, Hendrickson Farm, on and on it went, as the different companies that are supporting us even to this day in how to, in supporting and gathering equipment, supplies, storing them, warehousing them, getting them prepared and ready to go over to Liberia. So we were aiming for a thousand beds. And I was telling Francis, we had 700. They've been coming out of Toronto as well as out of British Columbia. And then earlier today, we got word there's another 100 beds up in Kamloops that they can bring down. So we got to 800. And then this evening at dinner, we found out there's 200 in Winnipeg. So we got our thousand that are going to Liberia. And it's not just beds. Every nook and cranny is filled with hospital linen and supplies and you name it, it gets pushed in there. If there's an inch to be had, we salvage that inch to find something to go in there that's of value to them. So we're just really honored to be here this evening. So just to give you um, uh, a little sense of what how the evening's going to transpire, we have um, we're introducing a number of, of um, uh, different facets, um, and one of them is that tonight's a partnership with the BC Council for International Cooperation, and we only just learned of each other's existence in recent days, and it was so delightful when they were eager to have an event and to host it um, as well uh, via YouTube. So we're really pleased to have it um, live as well. We also have um, a reception plan. So we have um, treats and coffee and water and Perrier water and all sorts of things upstairs available. So you can have a chat with Dr. Keta later on and they can meet us, pick me up, we can go get a cup of coffee and. Uh, that should be really great. And we also are very honored to have a member of Rotary, Brian Parkinson's donations that are coming in by leaps and bounds. He asked me a while ago, would you like me to collect some runners for the kids <coughs> and people over in Liberia? And I said, oh, that'd be wonderful. How many should I collect? And I said, 200. How about 200? And he went, 200? <gasps> Well, it turned out that because I asked for that amount, he went outside the box, ended up collecting and finding out there's more than 200, and now there's more being donated. There are more. Are you, Mrs. Parkinson? <laughs> I don't have a garage anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just wonderful to see the donations and the support that's come in. Well, Francis Keta, he was born in Liberia in a village in a hut, I would assume. Yeah, he did not get born in a hospital. And he was raised, and his mother had lost the use of her eye. So she, one eye was gone. And it bothered him, and he asked her later on, Mom, what happened to your eye? And she said, well, I had a problem, and I, I couldn't, I, I, there was no doctor to help figure out why I was having problems. So. Um, I went to an herbalist, and the herbalist put medicine in my eye, and I went blind. And so from the age of 12, Francis wanted to be a doctor. 
But did he have any money? No. But he applied himself in school and graduated from high school. And he got his job through the help of, of was it a bishop, Francis, or a bishop, to do housekeeping in a little rural hospital. And he would sweep the floors and walk in and peering in the surgery window every time there was a surgery being done. And the surgeons came out one time and said, why are you looking in the window? And he said, because I want to be a doctor. And he says, well, why aren't you in school? Because my parents cannot afford it. And that doctor helped start the ball rolling and invested in him. And he went to school and became a doctor. And years later, graduated with a master's in hospital administration as well as home security and disaster preparedness. Basically setting up the needs for his leadership during the biggest crisis of Liberia's life. So on that note, I'd like to introduce Francis Teka to the podium. Thank you so much, Madge. You know, <clears throat> when you talk, when you talk about me, and I normally turn around and say, "Well, who is this person?" You know, and uh, but it's good to see you all. You know, I'm sure you had a very long day, and um, I'm glad that you have the time to want you to come over and listen to me and hear what has transpired in Liberia, especially during the worst crisis globally when it comes to public health. That is Ebola. And so, Ebola basically started back in 1976. But there was nothing much said about Ebola because normally whenever it occurs, it happens in a very small village, an isolated area, and few persons are infected, and either die, and those that survive, and that's it. But it started from Zaire. And then in December of 2013, Ebola came straight to our neighborhood. And that is in the West African region. <clears throat> and the three most infected countries was Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. But it started from Guinea. And so, what happened? Where the red dot is was where the first case started in the Ekidu area. And the in this case was a two-year-old child. Um, there's still a lot of questions to be answered. But for me, why should you begin to ask where a bullet is coming from or where was that bullet made in the middle of a war? You first have to make sure that there's peace, there's ceasefire, and then after ceasefire, you can begin to do more investigation. So for now, <coughs> that's the end of that story. But from that little town, what happens? Ebola went into Liberia, went into a deeper part of Guinea, and into Sierra Leone. What is more critical is how did the three countries handle it? For Liberia, we had no experience. The experiences we had, or what we read about, was how it was handled in Zaire, in Uganda, and that was the experience that we had. And then the most recent one was how the Guineans and the Serbians were handling Ebola. And so we decided to, to follow the same, the same trend. And following the same trend, it did not get us anywhere. We had our first case in Liberia in March of 2014. And that case came through Lofa County, a town called Poya. We did not have the means to diagnose Ebola. So the specimen was taken into Guinea. And so it took time to actually know that we were dealing with Ebola. But the interesting thing about it is that uh, while that was going on in Guinea, they had so many cases. Initially, they thought it was Lhasa. 
because Ebola is an interesting virus. It mimics malaria. It will show signs and symptoms like malaria, Lassa fever, typhoid, you just name that. So it became a little problem. But the pictures there could tell you exactly what was going on. On the, in March, Dr. Walter Gwenningade, who was then the Minister of Health, announced to the world that indeed there was Ebola in Liberia. We had our first case. That case was handled some kind of way and went down. We had no more case for a couple of, for a couple of weeks. And then, boom, a case appeared in one of the most densely populated areas in Liberia, and that is Nuku Town, where you have Redemption Hospital. Nuku Town is quite interesting. I'm from the Kru tribe, and uh, the Kru people believe in, you know, spending time when someone dies. This is when the family comes around. This is when they weep, they merry make, because what happens? At six o'clock in the morning, they begin to cry. And by the time they get through crying, breakfast is ready. So they are ready to eat. Then around 11, going to 12, they begin to cry. Because by 12 o'clock, lunch is ready. And then by 5, they begin to cry. Because by 6 o'clock, dinner is ready. So that continues for two to three weeks. And they never make and so forth. But at the same time, they spend time mingling together. And Ebola, that's a disease that decided to change the cultural norms of us within a sub-region. You know, a typical African who like to hug, who like to, to weep and, you know, do some things. But one of the things that have happened is that Majority of the cases we have, guess who were infected the most? It was Hindu. Why? Because of the innate thing that is within them, caring. They take care of those that are sick, and so they got infected. But it took so much that was done, and on May 9, we were declared Ebola free, meeting the guidelines set by WHO. That for a country to be Ebola free, that country has to go for the two gates. That is two cycles. Without a single case, then they are declared Ebola free. So May 9, we were declared Ebola free. But what happened? There were a lot of things that happened prior to May 9. We lost so many lives. We had, remember initially I told you that we did not have the laboratory equipment, so specimen was sent to Guinea. So maybe the difference between the confirmed cases and the total amount of people that died may have played some role. But those cases that were confirmed as Ebola related, 3,150 out of the 4,785 deaths. But another thing that is important, you are looking at a country with a population of almost 4 billion. So if you're having close to 5,000 people die, you think of the calculation with the percentage of these people. But one thing that is also critical is that prior to Ebola, there were 71 plus practicing physicians in Liberia. Out of that, you have the nurses, the PAs, the ratio was terrible, mm -hmm. and it's still terrible. And you have 378 of the healthcare workers. Those were the first responders. Those were the foot soldiers. Those were the people that were there to fight this disease. 
378 got infected. And what that, what did it do? It demoralized a lot of healthcare workers. But not only that, out of that 192 died. Out of that 192, five of them were physicians. And among the five, one was the only infectious disease specialist in the country. <coughs> and so this is how close this disease was. This is what this disease has caused to our country and was trying to build its healthcare system. And so we had to deploy various mechanisms in order to deal with Ebola. Remember, I indicated that the experiences we had, those that we read about from Uganda and from Zaire, and then the most recent was what's happening in Guinea and Sierra Leone. And so, we started off using what we, we read about, what we knew. And so we went and began a quarantine. We quarantined a place called West Point. We quarantined a place called Dolostan, <coughs> using military means. And in, in West Point, what happened? In Liberia, people do not have the flexibility to keep food for two, three, four days. Everyone was a hustler. You go out today and find something and you eat, and then you go out the next morning to find something to eat. So those within the West Point area didn't have anything extra. And so when they were quarantined, after a couple of hours, there was no food, there was nothing, they decided to break the quarantine and go and find food. In the process, there was an open fire, someone got killed. That was sad, so many things were said, but also, it was an eye opener for us. It was a lesson learned. It was indicating to us that, look, you cannot use a you cannot use a military means, you cannot use a military strategy to fight a public health disease. You have to go to the basis. And the basis is very simple. Every disaster begins in the community, it ends in the community. So from day one, you have to have the community involvement. You have to engage the community. You have to educate the community. The community has to have ownership of the disease or the disaster. And if that happens, it makes your job much easier because they then become the first responder. They become the, those that are going to tell you what is happening. They are going to tell you if there's a new neighbor that comes in, they will tell you that, oh, this person didn't live here, but he came in last night, and we are not too sure. So please come and get him out. And so this is what we did. But to get to that point, her Excellency, Mother Ellen Johnson Sully, decided to take on the task. She became the Ebola Task Force manager. Many a times, leaders will always shift responsibility to others so that when they fail, we can blame them. But if you, as a leader, you decide to be the head, if you fail, what happens? And so she took a major risk. But I think because she took a risk and because she took this leadership unto herself, we all decided to follow suit and do whatever we can to make her feel good, but at the same time to save our nation. Through the intervention of others, including CDC, Dr. Tom Freedom, we established the incident management system. But within the incident management system, we had the PACE that is the Presidential Advisory Committee on Ebola. That committee was chaired by the president, and we had to brief the president every Friday and tell her where we were in terms of the response, how many persons have died, how many persons have survived, and where we are having difficulties, and what are some of the challenges. And so, within the incident manager, management system, we had a chairperson, and the chairperson is Tawa Nesma. So he was the chair. We also had Dawa Jala, who served as the deputy incident manager for support services. And your humble servant served as deputy incident manager over the medical response and planning. And what did we do? 
Under that, we have a couple of areas. We have laboratory, which is very critical because we needed to get specimen and have them tested and get the result as soon as possible because that gives us the go ahead on contact tracing. Who are those that got in contact with this in this case? So we had epi surveillance. They had to tell us what was going on, how many persons have been infected, where are the areas, and so forth. Social mobilization. How do you go, how do you educate the people, tell them exactly what is going on, and so forth. The contact tracers, case management. On the case management, we had psychosocial, we had dead body management. That was very critical. You know, in Liberia, we did not believe in cremation. It was against the norms and the cultural belief of the Liberian. And so, when we begin to have that many dead, sometimes there will be about 60 to 70 bodies. And one of the things we learned from Ebola is that when a person is about to die, this is when the disease becomes more virulent. Why? Because this disease wants to survive. It realizes that, oh, I'm being depleted of oxygen. There's no more oxygen. I'm being strangulated. I need to get out. So it comes over towards the surface. And so when a person dies, that person has the capacity of spreading the disease faster. And so safe burial was the key to put them into body bags and then put them minimum six feet. We did not have the capacity based on the amount of people that were dying. So the president took an unprecedented action of cremation. So we began to commit bodies. To do some of the things we did, we had to follow some of the old methods, trying to draw a line, okay, it was Mary, and Mary, we think she had a contact with, with, with Paul, and Paul had a contact with James, and so forth. So based on that, we were able to, to put into a system of what the contacts are, and so forth. And that led us to doing something spectacular. After we had a guest, Dr. Hans Rossman, he came from Sweden and came over, an epidemiologist, you know, he has been an old hand in the business, and he brought in some refined process, refined system for us. And based on that, from March, like I indicated, we had a first case, and then we had a little break, so it was like zero, and then by June, July, this case appeared in New Kutan, and based on the cultural belief and so forth, we had an exponential increment in the amount of cases. So this is what happened. And uh, at that point, there were a lot of predictions that were made. One of the predictions indicated that we will have about 2,200 new cases per week. Remember, you are talking about a country with just 4 million people. So if you're having 2,200 cases per week, your entire population will be carried away. And so we had to let the president know that this is just prediction. We're going to do whatever it takes to break this chain down. And guess what did we break the chain? We broke it at 220 a week when we broke it and begin to bring the curve down. And breaking the curve down was a little difficult thing, but when we started to bring it down, it came down. And then it came to the single digit. You know, what happened is that when we had the exponential increment in the amount of cases, we didn't have to work too hard because the cases came to find us. But as we got into single digit, we had to go out there to find 
the cases. And that was the painstaking aspect of fighting Ebola. Because you had to find, it's almost like a, a stack of hay and find that needle. Because if you don't find that needle, that needle could cause a major problem to the entire uh, stack. So we had to do that. And we had to deploy a lot of means to do that. And so we came down to zero, and we were almost there. And we came to a point where we have mapped out and knew exactly where our next case would come up. Because now we've mastered it. And we knew how many persons were, were being contacted within our data and so forth. And then the worst happened. In the St. Paul River area, we knew a place and we anticipated someone coming down with Ebola. And we told them, if you have any sign and symptom, any fever, muscle pain, diarrhea, vomiting, red eye, and so forth, please call us so that we can give you care. Nope. This 15-year-old woman did not call and decided to escape. And in the process of escaping, guess what happened? She infected, she got in contact with people, and those people got infected. But you see that there's a herbalist. She went over to a herbalist for treatment. And what happens? That continues. And so, we had this chain going on. And what happens? It continues. So from that single case, in other words, Labua would have been Ebola free way before the night of May, had it not been for this case. And what happened then, from this single case? Boom. All those in the black die. And those in the red survive. I'm saying this to show you exactly what happened. Why this disease was so difficult to contain. Why you could not use one mechanism. You could not use one method. You couldn't use one strategy to get this done. You have to do it per case. And so we came up with a new strategy. We could not use the word quarantine because in West Point, quarantine was used and someone got killed. We could not isolate, say, use isolation because people felt if you isolate, if you isolate them, you are telling them go and die. So we couldn't use that. So we came up with a word called Precautionary Observation Center. A Precautionary Observation Center was for those that were active contact. So for my index case, if that case became positive, all those that were in the immediate proximity of that positive case have become an active contact. So we got all of the active contact and put them into a place and fed them sometimes three, four times a day and provided additional things that will keep them so that we are able to monitor them so that we cannot have what happened with this 15-year-old lady. And so, this is what happened. Then after this third generation, we went for 29 days in Liberia without a single outbreak, without a single case. Then on March 20, something amazing happened in Liberia that changed everything we've learned about Ebola. On March 20, a 44-year-old lady became ill and was taken over to a redemption hospital. Remember, I called redemption hospital before. There were the kids that went over that led to this outbreak. When? Now, the last case we had 
that n led us to complete Ebola, to end Ebola in Liberia, and up at the Dental Hospital. Within two hours of my appearance at the hospital, sample was collected, and the result came positive for Ebola. And wow, what has happened? Was there a secret barrier going on somewhere? Was there something going on we didn't see? Was there any contact? Because this has gone 29 days. So, in reality, after 21 days, if there is no active case, then there shouldn't be an active virus around. So where did the case come from? We went over to investigate, and we talked to people. Did anyone come from Sierra Did anyone come from Guinea to visit this lady? No. Did she travel out of the country? No. So where did it come from? And bum bum, was there a survivor involved? Because when the male survivor leaves the Ebola treatment unit, they are told that within three months, please do not have unprotected sex. Because the virus, for what we've learned prior to this case, was that the virus lived up to 82 days. So, we said 90 days. And if you want to, use a condom. So, I'm thinking, okay, was there a survivor? And so we begin to investigate, and yes, indeed, there was a survivor. But something happens. This survivor left the treatment unit 175 days before he had an encounter with this woman. So that has changed everything we, we knew about Ebola and so forth. What do we do? We found him. We got a blood specimen from him. Yes, his IgG title was high, so yes, he was a survivor. What we needed was and we get the semen. After four days of persuasion, we found they got semen sample from him, tested it, and boom, it was positive for Ebola. So that has changed. The WHO protocol it has changed everything. And so the new protocol now is that after 90 days, you still have to check the semen. If you have two negative, then of course that's fine. But until you have two negative, that person has to have, I should not have unprotected sex. They should use condom and so forth. And so this, these are things that we are learning of Ebola, which is quite interesting. But within two hours of this woman being Ebola positive, we were able to track down the 43 contacts she has made. And so this is how robust we have become, how efficient we are in terms of dealing with this disease. So, Liberia has gone three cycles of that, more than, uh, more than 60, 60 plus days, but we still have cases within Sierra Leone and Guinea not basically along the Liberian border. The Liberian border are okay, but we are not stopping there. We continue to do those things that lead us to keep Ebola out of Liberia to get to zero, and that's epi surveillance, making sure that we can map out all of the cases and whatever happens and so forth, we try to do that putting our IPC together, active surveillance into the community, going out there, making sure that there is no rumor of a secret death or secret burial or someone is sick and they are hiding that person and so forth. And all of these things take into consideration community involvement. We had ETUs and so forth. The first set of ETUs that were built and so were built out of tarpaulin and so forth. And later on, we decided to change the flavor a little and use reefs. So the one up there is there out of reefs, which is a similar permanent structure. 
And uh, we are going to use that into something else and so forth. But the one with the flag, the American flag and the Liberian flag, is called the MMU. The MMU was the Monrovia Medical Unit. This was built by the US military and was manned by the public health uh, services, the uh, core group that came over doctors, nurses, and so forth that provided first hand service to healthcare workers. So whenever a healthcare worker was infected, he or she would go there for treatment. And because of that, confidence was built. Healthcare workers realized that I can go out there to fight, and just in case if I'm infected, I could get a quality care. And so this is what was provided to us. And so partnership played a major role. We began to have laboratories, and so we have about six functional laboratories in Liberia that we can detect Ebola depends where it occurred, where we get a specimen from. Within four to 12 hours, we should be able to determine whether that person has Ebola or not. So it's how efficient and effective we've become. <clears throat> to get to that, it took so much. It take building up the ETUs, getting health workers, giving them incentives, and it took some dollars in order to do those things. And it was very critical as we fought the disease. So, we are at zero. What would it take for us to maintain zero? It takes infection prevention and control, establishing a triage system in all of the clinics, health centers, and hospitals, looking at equipping them, students going to school, establishing hand washing stations, and so forth. So it takes into consideration so much of things that we didn't do. Those basic things, fundamentals that should have been done earlier, we have to put that in place. But most importantly, deepening the community engagement. How do we get involved with the community? How do we engage them? How do the community continuously become our first responder? And those are things that we are doing. And the border, we still have active cases in Guinea and Sierra Leone, so we have to strengthen our border. But the question is that do we have a border? No. There are places in Foyer and local county where someone house, the bedroom is in Liberia, the kitchen is in Guinea or Sierra Leone. So, where is the border? And what do we do is, how do you educate these people to understand that look, if someone comes over that is sick, make sure you call healthcare workers, do not touch that person, and if you don't touch that person, you will be okay. Call the healthcare workers, let us make sure we check them and make sure they do not have Ebola. And by educating people, we can continue to maintain zero. There were times it was tough. Liberia is a developing country. There's st still not continuous public electricity and so forth. So we used to work in the darkness to do some of the work because there was no electricity. There was a cooperation, international cooperation. So you have a US general, General Volosky, a Sweden epidemiologist, Dr. Hans Rosling, a Chinese general, General Yen, all standing together, rubbing shoulder to shoulder in order to fight Ebola. What we are not saying in the back is also the cooperation we've gotten from African countries. The AU sent epidemiologists from Zaire, from Kenya, from Nigeria, from Ghana, and so forth. Everyone came over to Liberia to help us make sure that we got rid of this. And because of the cooperation and the continued involvement of the leadership of the government. And that's one of the PACE meetings, the Presidential Advisory Committee on Ebola. And that's the president sitting at the head of the table. Every Friday, we have to brief her on what was going on in terms of Ebola. 
And she will ask the difficult question and ask her, when would it be over? Why there is a delay? Why am I hearing that this is happening here? Why there are too many dead bodies and so forth? And we have to answer those questions. And because of that continuous engagement, that continual leadership, that continuous pushing us a little, making us to think outside the box, this is how Liberia has become Ebola free. So, in conclusion, we understand, and I'm sure the world is excited about what has happened in Liberia. <coughs> but I can tell you, and Dr. Moses Masekwe was the one in charge of case management, and he was the first Liberian that wore a PPE, and he taught all Liberians on how to use a PPE. Even before the international partners came in, we were already doing what we needed to do to contain it. And Dr. Masako was the leader. But today we can tell you that yes, indeed, we are being considered declared Ebola free. We feel that it is not over until it is over. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Keta. Very insightful. We're going to take uh, time for questions and answers, but we're going to take a little break, give him a chance to uh, rest his voice. He's been speaking several times today. First, I'd like to call up Salamat. Now, Salamat is a part of the BC Council of International Cooperation. Now, Salamat, what's your position there? program officer. And we've only just learned of each other recently, and she's going to share with you a little bit about their their group and uh, association. Okay. Thank you very Bull much. And Julie Bull and Bobby. Yeah, um, so yeah, I work for the BC Council for International Cooperation. We are a provincial network of Canadian nonprofits that do uh, development work overseas, and then who are committed to the sustainable development in a in a, in a peaceful environment. And then we do provide um, networking opportunities, training, and then um, presenting interests of the Canadian nonprofits working overseas to the government. Um, uh, we were very much interested uh, in Dr. Kate's presentation because uh, in January, February, and March, uh, we did a provincial tour um, at six uh, regions of BC, uh, we we looked at the we took the Ebola case like uh, the Ebola virus case um, to to see it from the global citizenship perspective and then how the Canadian like federal and provincial government should support um, nonprofits uh, battling you know uh, working in the front lines and then how we as British Columbians should uh, respond and uh, take active participation in responding to any kind of pandemic uh, that could happen. And um, so, yeah, thank you very much. And then if you have any questions, please feel free to approach me. And then I also have my colleague, Karin Wong, who is uh, providing live streaming for this event. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for, for your presentation. Salamat, wonderful. These opportunities don't come around all the time. When they do, you grab them and hang on to them. So we look forward to future collaboration together. Well, I we've been sharing with uh, the other groups that we've been meeting with how we aim, was aiming to ship a thousand beds over to Liberia. We figured it takes about twenty containers. That's a lot of containers. And we've sent eight containers over already. And we've got 12 more to go, and five are actually ready to roll right now. And I have brochures that I will hand out here, as well as newsletters, sharing with you about some of the things that Corley Bonero Science Foundation are doing over in Liberia and West Africa. And the need for support in order to get the rest of the beds over there. Dr. Keta, 
can you just tell me what's the import of beds? Why is it so important that we're shifting beds? What about those beds is special? You know, um, prior to Ebola, I was running a 250-bed hospital as the medical director and CEO. And uh, we had beds that were made in China. And uh, they had no railing and so forth. So if you had a patient, someone has to monitor that patient or else he or she falls from the, from the bed. But we were lucky. There are places in Liberia, in other counties where there is no bed. And even if there were a bed, there is no mattress. So patient after surgery will be lying down on a bed spring or take a car bowl and open it up and put it on the spring and lie down on it. I mean, we are in the 21st century when there is so much that is out there and so forth. And this is why it is important. And now that I've been taken away from Jackson Hebdo Hospital and has been placed at the, the hem of healthcare in Liberia, as the Deputy Minister of Health and the Surgeon General of the country, all of the hospitals, clinics, falls under my supervision. And so, Jackson F. Doe Hospital has already gotten some, you know, gotten beds because of the Colibu Neuro Foundation and all of the good people here that have been helping. But there are many other hospitals that don't have. And so it's important that these beds get to Liberia because they are not only going to save life, but they're going to make a difference between someone who is in severe pain and trying to to nurture their pain than someone who may get more infection because where he or she is lying is not conducive enough. Most importantly, post Ebola, it will be a travesty if we do not look at those people. And just a bed. But the good thing about it is that whatever the beds are going, it's not only there alone. Those beds, they are a lot of good things. Some goodies that go along with them. And those things make the kids happy. You know, the last time we had a couple of soccer balls that went to the, the kids, they had a jersey, they had their, their soccer shoes and so forth. And those little things change the life of individuals. It gives them another hope. It makes them to understand that, oh, there is someone else that cares. You know, I heard a story about the starfish. There was a lady who decided that, you know, all of the time the starfish comes towards the shore, the waves bring them, and they do not get back. So she decided, okay, every morning, instead of just lying in bed, I'm going to get up at 5 o'clock every morning and walk along the beach for at least an hour and a half and help those starfish and put them back into the ocean. And so there was this mature guy coming over every morning jogging and seeing her bending over and so forth. He said, look, what are you doing? Every morning I pass by, you are bending over, throwing these things there and so forth. And she didn't say a word and continued to do her job. He said, look, I'm talking to you, young lady. I mean, you are wasting your time. There are millions of starfish lying here. What can you do to them? And with us saying a word, she bent over, took one or two, and said, I've made a difference in our own life. The question to you, can you make a difference in one person's life in Liberia? Thank you. Thank you. It's really important, and you, know, you keep safe brochures and share them with your family, your colleagues. We would really appreciate that because we feel very committed to reaching out and letting Liberians know they're not alone. There are people over in Canada that care and they're providing. And one bed value retail would be eight thousand. Second hand, three to four thousand. If you put fifty on a container, you can imagine the value of that container. And that container costs seven five hundred to ship from Vancouver to Monrovia. So the cost of the entire container is covered by one single bed. So that's terrific. Well, one other guest I'd like to have come up is Mrs. Parkinson.
Could you come momentarily? <laughs> Brian Parkinson, her husband, is a go-getter. And I met him at a Rotary event not long ago, and he collects sneakers for East Side, I believe, of Vancouver residents. Hi. Hi. Um, we're part of a, the triathlon community, and we always think, how can we give back? Well, we've gone to a lot of our friends. We have gone to uh, the running stores, and they have got containers. Um, our, our bill going from Langley over to Maple <laughs> Ridge on the bridge. Oh but anyway, <laughs> the thing of it is, is that Rotary has always been a part of what can we do to help other countries. And their main goal is to eradicate polio on the planet. And they're getting this close. Mm -hmm. So this is something that Brian and I decided that we were going to do. A lot of the marathoners, they wear their shoes for one race and they look brand new and they will have support for someone. So um, if you have a running store or if you have um, a group that you know of, then encourage them and maybe we can send more shoes. Um, we also supply uh, shoes for Wagner Hills, which is the men's Rehabilitation Center, Stepping Stones, which is people with uh, mental disabilities and physical, House of Hope for women, um, the Senior Center. We give a lot of shoes to the seniors, and it's amazing how thankful they are because they can't afford shoes. And, of course, you guys. So um, I think we've got the last count. There's almost 800 pairs of shoes. Do you hear that? Yeah. Now, come on up, Francis, and let's get a picture with three pairs. <coughs> and hold a pair of shoes behind you. 800 pair. That is absolutely fantastic. Wow. Thank you. Can you imagine the difference in the villagers when they get that pair of shoes? Definitely. I think we're going to have more, more smiling faces. <laughs> And quality lives. Definitely. They won't get cuts on their skin. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. All right, so let's open up. Now I've got a little place. <laughs> open up for questions and answers. So, Derek, go ahead. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Francis Peter. Um, actually, uh, my name is Derek, and I'm from Ghana in West Africa. So, you can just imagine when I had Ebola in West Africa, I was very nervous. But I knew that right from Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, is coming to Ghana. And I have my family and all my members living there. But the, the question I have is that in Ghana, in, in Africa, you know we have our cultures, right? And beliefs and traditions. And um, for example, dead bodies. We, we bury dead bodies, we dress them, we touch them. You know, what to give them a, a well-befitting burial. And with Ebola, I know that those things are contrary to or is pro spreading Ebola. So my question: How are we able to um, to to fight against those cultural challenges that you know you you faced during this um, difficult time? Thank you so much, Derek. Um, that was very difficult for everyone because, as I indicated, Ebola basically came purposely to stop us from those cultural beliefs and practices. It was very difficult. We educated people on don't touch the body. When you touch, this is what's going to happen. But yesterday, people couldn't believe. Sometimes it took the worst for people to realize. For example, you may have an entire house wiped out, you know, I went to this area in Monrovia called the Matadi area. There was a fellow there who was a physician assistant. And with everything that was happening, he was there treating Ebola patients. He came down with Ebola and he died. And guess what? 
you know, we have the way of family excuses. When he died, his wife died, he said, oh, both of them had an oath that when one person dies, the other person cannot live. So this is why they died. But the sister who hid the bodies, took the body over to a funeral home and so forth, even with all of the education, she didn't believe it, she also died. Her son, and just from that case, an entire family of 23. So that sends a signal to the community and say, look, and as these things happen, we had a group, the social mobilization group. They were going to the community and telling people of these things. And you need to stop this. If you stop this, this is what's going to happen. If you continue, this is what's going to happen. And so based on those things and some of the most difficult things that happened because people did not listen, people had to learn the hard way. Those that believe and so forth, their lives were saved. Those who didn't, sometimes pay a high price. But I think it took so much to get to that point. Up to now, it's still a little situation we still, but I think most people now understand the consequences of that, and we think that we are going to try to maintain that. Like in Liberia now, for everybody that dies, we have to do a mock swap, you know, to make sure that that person did not die from Ebola. So all of these things are being done. Even with the Muslim community, uh, the Christian communities and so forth, we work with the imams, work with the pastors and so forth on what needs to be done. And safe barrier is what we, we preach. And safe barrier means don't touch, get those that are trained to prepare the body and put the body into a body bag and the body is buried. Thank you very much. I'm a librarian and I was there last year doing field work for my PhD. So for the first time, I was born in Morovia, so for the first time I had the opportunity to go to Lofa, Nimba, Maryland, of course, and Morovia. So I have two short questions for you. One is, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, just very few moments that I, I'm very proud to be a librarian and really sweet to listen to you uh, deliver your uh, presentation. So my two question is, one, and maybe it's just my bias because my research is, on, is all about women. I didn't really notice a lot of um, attention towards women. I think as I was following a Ebola in Liberia, I did hear a read about local women doing a lot of stuff. And I would like for you to kindly highlight few examples about how women really sacrificed. Did they actually lost the most, but they also were the one who really sacrificed at the very lower community level to um, make sure that your people are curbed in Liberia. My second question is, um, going to Maryland, Nimba, and Lofa, and then of course parts of Maserato, which is um, partly Morovia, I never really understood how poor Liberia was. And um, I would really like for you to throw some light on or give some insight on what Liberia is really doing to deal with the systematic setup of healthcare provision in Liberia. I know when you leave Morovia, just very few outskirts, like my mom lived on Tuboro, so you know. Tupuru is not very far from Morovia Central, but at the same time, Tupuru still has a lot of limitations that extend all the way to Maryland and Nimba and places that I've never been in Liberia until last year. So I would just really like to see from that perspective what Liberia is actually doing to deal with the systematic and holistic problems of poor healthcare system. Thank you. Thank you so much for those beautiful questions. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to female, uh, during my last presentation, I talked about the role women play. You know, for we the men, many a times we boast and say, oh, the Bible said, 
a man is the head of the home. You know, but there's something that the Bible quietly said that we didn't pay, we are not reading in. The Bible states that, yes, men, you are the head of the home, but the woman is the neck. And wherever the neck turns, the way the head turns. And so, many of the things that happen in Liberia is because of the involvement of women. For example, the president of Liberia, the active role she played, you know, if that would have been a man's president in Liberia, he would have dedicated the responsibility to someone else and said, no, I'm not going to, to head this. If you feel I'm going to blame you, I will tell the international community, you are not qualified, you are not competent, and so forth. But she took up the leadership. And so that's very, very important in Liberia. I think one of the things that I've seen in Liberia is that Women involvement, for example, during the civil crisis, it took women sitting in the sun 24-7 to bring the civil war in Liberia to an end. It also took women during this Ebola crisis where they, we had women that were praying continuously, fasting, and talking to their children, talking to their husbands, and so forth, to bring Ebola to an end. So women are very, very crucial. And most importantly, they even got a brain because of the innate thing that they are involved with, in, <coughs> that is getting care. And so they were more infected, and most of them have lost their lives and so forth because trying to do what they were brought forth to do, to take care of people. And so we know that, and this is something that can't. Even now, during the this process, the survivors, the stigmatism and so forth, sometimes are better at winning. You know, so we understand this and we're trying to work with it and make sure that we stop this thing. In terms of the healthcare system, you know, Liberia had an opportunity. We had a civil crisis in Liberia for many years. And at the end of the civil crisis, what happened? A woman emerged as president of Liberia. And the entire world honored Liberia and whatever healthcare system we wanted to build, we would have built it. We missed up some, we missed up on some opportunities. But many a times, it is not good to, to cry over a spill meal. Milk. Many a times you do not have a second opportunity. Why it is true that Ebola wasn't a good thing for Liberia, but what Ebola has done for Liberia is that it has removed the curtain over the weak healthcare system we have in the country. But it opens this curtain with the international community looking at Liberia, looking at Sierra Leone, looking at Guinea. So this has opened up another opportunity for us. And so what we have to do now is that there are some structures, infrastructures have been built, but we have to begin to say, okay, where are the gaps? How can we bridge this gap? How can we strengthen the healthcare system? How can we harness the relationship we build with the community into providing primary health care and looking at the secondary level and the tertiary level. But we have to be realistic and pragmatic on what we want and what the health care system has to be. And based on that, we should be able to build a strong and resilient health care service. And I think this is something that I can tell you that as Chief Medical Officer of Liberia, we will strive to make sure that the healthcare system in Liberia becomes stronger. Thank you. We have a question from Laura on the live stream. And she's asking, I have read that midwives and opgynes were some of the hardest hit healthcare providers. How is this care doing now? How many opgynes are left in Liberia and how many midwives? Laura, thank you so much. Uh, one of the things that happened 
Initially, instead of, like, for example, there was a case in uh, a place called Dosa, one of the places that were quarantined. And what happened was there was a 30 year old female who was about, she was in her second trimester and came down with Ebola and died in Dosa. And from that one case, because of what was done, we had more than, we can track more than 40 persons that died because of their practices and so forth. Midwife, and we did not have enough ob in Liberia. I think in the entire country, we still have about three or four ob But okay. well, basically the midwives and some of our nurses were in the front line. And because they did not have the protective gear, for instance, the long gloves that will stop them up to their their arms and so forth. They were exposed to blood, and remember blood and Ebola work together. And so, we had a couple of deaths. We had some, some of our male wives that got infected. Some of them are survivors and so forth. So what is happening now is that we have brought in through UNFPA, brought in enough gloves, delivery gloves and so forth, and pushing you know, IPC, infection prevention and control, how to protect themselves. We tell people the story. Whenever you get on board an aircraft, what happens? It tells you when the oxygen mask drop, put your own on first before you help the next person. And so as healthcare workers, we have to change our psyche of how we practice as clinicians. We have to first protect ourselves, then we can take care of our patients. And so this is what we are pushing for, and hopefully with this, we should be able to save lives of male wives and other healthcare providers. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'd say congratulations to Liberia for eradicating liberating from Ebola. Uh, um, my question is like, from your presentation, you have emphasized many times that due to the strong, your strong president and your, the system going on in Liberia, um, it, it was due to this that it, Liberia was able to move on and like remove Ebola from the country. I was wondering, do you, would you know how Sierra Leone or uh, Guinea are doing as like what their system is and how they are doing like with po the politics politi polit politics, and uh, what they are going through. And has um, Liberia made any attempt to communicate with Guinea and Sierra Leone to like further eradicate Ebola as a whole? Thank you so much. That is a very beautiful question. Yes, indeed. Um, what we've done is that shared experience, you know, like I indicated, it is not over until it is over. We have sent people over to Sierra Leone to help them. We sent people over to Guinea to help them. And uh, we're trying to do whatever it takes, you know, to help them. Because as long as there is still Ebola in Guinea and Sierra Leone, Liberia is not free. The probability of a rebound is very high. So we are working together. We are looking at it from a regional perspective. For example, when I get back to Liberia, I have been in discussion with the, the delegation representative there to call a meeting of the chief medical officers of the four countries, that is Ivory Coast, uh, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, so that we can meet and begin to share notes and try to see how we can build a network and look at other diseases, not only Ebola, but Lassa fever, uh, yellow fever, and so forth, so that we can begin to share information so that tomorrow we cannot go through what we are going through now. So yes, indeed, we are concerned about what is happening. Even our president is concerned about what is happening in Guinea and Sierra Leone. Uh, I've gone with the president of Liberia twice to, to Guinea to discuss Ebola issues and so forth. And so we are doing whatever it takes to help them. But you know, you can help someone 
to a certain extent, and then the finishing is left with them. So we are still monitoring and we're working along with them and hoping that very, very soon they can also be declaring more like this. Just a follow up. Um, sure. So what do you think the other Clagini and Sierra Leone is doing like differently that makes them unsuccessful where Liberia was successful? Oh, that is good. Uh, yeah, you asked that question. Uh, <laughs> what I think what is happening, I may be wrong, but I think what is happening is that if you use a military strategy to fight a public health disease, is a little problem. The difference that you see is that in Sierra Leone, the head of the Ebola task force is a military personnel. In Liberia, we were using public health practitioners. And we were doing more community engagement and so forth. So in the military, yes, when the general comes, everybody stays, stay, you know. And that's it. When the general leaves, what happens? People do their own thing. So there are a couple of things that we are looking at, and that could be there. Another thing, again, is the fact that in Liberia, we've had our president involved from day one. In Sierra Leone, there has been some problem between the president and the vice president during the heat of the Ebola crisis. The vice president was fired. So whether that plays a role, I don't know. In Guinea, there is election that could happen in Guinea sometime soon. So the those that want to become president and so forth, in the political rivalry is also there. Is that playing a role in what is happening? I don't know. But I think looking at what we've done differently, I think that could be one of the reasons. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Keta. Um, my name is Andrew, I'm a graduate student at UBC here, and, um, so for, and I also haven't been to Africa, like many of our uh, people who have asked questions so far, so forgive my ignorance. Uh, initially, from your presentation and from other stuff that I've read on the Ebola crisis, it seems the main problem has been problems of infrastructure. It's really um, how to get people isolated, and as you said, you elucidated some, some of the problems with that. But moving forward for future crises of Ebola or other diseases, how is, would you really see where the, the biggest room for improvement is? Is it in diagnosis? Is it in trying to improve, say, electricity for labs to be able to run um, experiments for diagnosis? Is, is it uh, improving healthcare and having more healthcare practitioners. So, um, and then my second question is, how has the Ebola crisis changed um, disease monitoring networks in Liberia? Thank you so much for those, you know, excellent questions. There are, first of all, had Ebola, you know, with the the amount of cases we had, had that happened in any country, that country would have had a major problem. Because, let me give you an example. There was one case in America, and with all of the, the sophistication, you saw what happened. So it's not only infrastructure and so forth, but this is a virulent disease that we were dealing with that the world did not know so much about this. We thought we knew so much of Ebola. We did not know much of Ebola until it happened in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. And still, we still have to learn more. You know, like, henceforth, there's still more research that is going on to learn more about Ebola. So that is the situation. So yes, indeed, we have a major infrastructure problem. But at the same time, we have to strengthen the basic fundamentals. And that is self-preservation. How do you prevent yourself, but at the same time willing to provide care? How do you do your differential diagnosis? How do you ask the requisite questions in order to get what you want to get? Those are the basic fundamentals that we have to. So one of the key things is continuous medical education is very, very critical in building the healthcare system in Liberia. 
The second portion is that how do we standardize the kind of services that we provide? If you leave from claim A to claim B, is there any standard? What, are, what should be the basic minimum that has to be at the clinic level, at the hospital level, and at a referral center level? We have to set those things and understand what it takes. Do we have the right people? Are they qualified? You know, if we send the equipments, are they qualified to run them? Let me give you an example. We have so many equipments at Jackson Airdo Hospital. Some of them have not even been opened. We have some that are broken down. We had a team of Chinese experts that were there and could not repair those equipments. And it took one person from right here in Canada who is right in this room. Within a couple of hours, he was able to repair 70 machines that were already broken down in a couple of days. And so, this is the situation. So, yes, indeed, we could say we need infrastructures, we need equipment, and so forth. But you cannot get the equipment if you don't have the right kind of people there to use it. It means nothing. So, we first have to understand what the gaps are. And with those gaps, how can we bridge those gaps in terms of bringing in the right people? If it means training more doctors, training more nurses, we need to understand those things and build the capacity of the people. And if we do that, definitely we can build a strong and robust healthcare system. Now, post Ebola, are we, are we prepared to fight any disease? Is there any network in terms of disease surveillance and so forth? Yes. From the lessons learned, the world now is turning onto us, and so we are building systems. We are going to look into our data. What are some of the disease? that was in the sub-region that we need to monitor. And if there is any problem, how do we communicate with one another? And I think one of the things that we didn't do well was prior to Ebola, we did not talk to each other. From Sierra Leone, from Guinea, from Liberia, we didn't know who, who was who in a particular area. Now Ebola has brought us together. And so that relationship we built, we want to continue to strengthen that relationship so that we can build this network. You know, and the network, a regional network that will help almost every one of us and those within the sub region. Oh, thank you very much. I'd like Derek to come down. Derek is Vice President of Corelli Bernard Science Foundation. And Derek represents Ghana, and Dr. Francis Keta represents Liberia. And we want to honor some people and groups and companies that have made the difference in what has been able to be sent over to support both Ghana and Liberia and Nigeria. First, I'd like Dr. Winston Gittins to come on down, Dr. Gittins. He's a neurosurgeon at, Van at Royal Columbian Hospital. And we have, yes, please give him a applause. <laughs> I've been working on Dr. Gittins to come on our medical missions, and he says, well, I might come and teach one time. <laughs> we want you to come, Congrats. come on over, and come and meet these fellas standing between them. And I'd like to present a certificate on behalf of KBNF and Jackson F. Doe Hospital. Certificate of Appreciation presented on June 22nd to Royal Columbian Hospital for assisting us in our efforts to improve neuroscience and healthcare in West Africa by donating medical equipment and supplies on an ongoing basis. And later this week, we have another uh, shipment being picked up at Royal Columbian by Diamond Delivery. And Diamond Delivery folks, if you ever need delivery, please call Diamond Delivery. They do all of our transportation for free have never charged a cent in 12 years and uh, within British Columbia. We really appreciate it. Would you like to just say a word? I'd like to thank you very much. And I, I have many years uh, when I began to become involved with the Carly Blue Foundation, I promised that I would uh, assist and I'm still gonna do that now that I'm retired. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm sort of semi-retired because they made me the medical director of the Royal Columbian Hospital. So I don't know if I'm going to have the time uh, in the next year or so. But anyhow, I, I accept this uh, 
because there are, I'm not the only one in the Royal Columbian Hospital, there are many individuals in the Royal Columbian Hospital uh, that have contributed to this. We, we work in with the uh, nurses in the operating room, uh, we work with everyone that we can see, and even some of the administration who are prepared to, to assist me in storing some of the things around the hospital and uh, providing us uh, uh, some help. So uh, we're gonna to continue to do what we've been doing, and uh, we, the good thing about this is that uh, the government, and you've probably heard this announced that we may be having a new hospital built. Mm -hmm. So uh, we may have some uh, beds uh, as well. <laughs> uh, hopefully in the near future along with some other things. So thank you very much. Thank you. Now is anyone from Cabro here? Come on down. Are you Peter? I'm Peter. I've never met Peter, but I've talked to him on the phone and we've emailed enough times to probably fill a few pages of notes come on over Kima. and Derek where are you Derek here we so appreciate what Peter and Cabro have done on behalf and continue to do I remember a few years ago we're going back about uh, maybe was it would be about three years or so our, our equipment acquisition and shipping chair was burnt out she was exhausted and we weren't having a really enough support to really continue on with gathering up things and getting them together and piling them into a container tightly and shipping them. So back she decided that perhaps we should call it a day. And we agreed as a board that we would give it a rest for a while and let our shipping partner in Victoria take over and we would send everything over to Victoria to Dell Workland and she could do it on our behalf. Well, within days of that conclusion, I get a call, and it's, I guess it's Nigel saying, Peter wants to know if you'd like some linen. Well, do you know how often you got linen? Never. And if you got pillowcases, you were like dancing in the street. I can remember going years saying, anybody got any old pillowcases in their closet? And we just never got them. Well, I couldn't say no. So I said, oh, sure, we'll take it. Well, I can't forget when Derek and Brenda, who was our shipping chair, who had signed off, came over to see what Peter had left for us over at Centennial. It was like, it reminds me of BC Stadium, <laughs> BC Place, full of skids of linen from all over British Columbia. Well, we laughed and laughed and laughed. And Brenda said, I guess we're back in the shipping industry again. <laughs> Since then, we have continued to receive linen. And in fact, it's life-saving. And I'd like Francis to quickly address this. We make what we call mat packs. And in those mat packs is a sheet and a gown and a bed pad. And then there's a little outfit for a newborn baby and a little toque, diaper, everything that they need to give birth to this baby. And so many babies in Liberia and moms die. They were, I think right now, are they... What's the incidence? The second highest in the world? The highest in the world, yes. Yeah. So, in fact, when these mat packs are shipped over and we're making hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them from Cabro Linen, in fact, we're saving them because the mums are going to hospital, are they not? Yes. Yeah. Uh, personally, the, the ratio now is 94, 94 deaths per 1,000. So, it's very high. So knowing that this mother in a village is going to get a gift and the baby's going to get a toy, these, these little toys are made all the way across Canada and shipped out here constantly, and then these mat packs are put together with a boy pack and a girl pack, well, we couldn't do it without Cabro, and right now they're screaming for something or other, I don't know, and they're saying, can you ask Peter if we were running low on this and that before Peter gets bombarded. So Peter, we've actually created two uh, certificates, one for yourself and one for your company. So, Peter, uh, we honor you and present you with the Certificate of Appreciation for, for assisting us in our efforts to improve neuroscience and healthcare in Africa by donating available surplus hospital linens on an ongoing basis. Thank you so much. That's a 
brand new sign, folks. They made it just special for this evening. So here is the other certificate, Peter and Derek, I'll let you present it to them. Do you have a word or two to say, Peter? Actually, I don't, I don't need to say much. Basically, I don't even <laughs> oh, think I need a mic, actually. <laughs> um, what we do is, whether we have surplus in it, we own all the linen for basically all four health authorities, whether it's Vancouver Coastal, Fraser. What we do is, whenever we have items that are discontinued, scrubs, for example, I know we just made a donation of 12,000 scrubs sets. All these sets actually help as much as possible. And when we found out that we're making an environmental impact here, as well as helping save lives somewhere else, uh, we jumped on it. And to continue this relationship is exactly what we're looking forward to doing. So I do have another donation ready to go. Oh, good. Let's just make it. <laughs> send the truck over and it's on its way. Wow. But thank you very much. I really, this is very educational for me. So oh, thank you. Thank, thank you very so much. Thank you. And those scrubs are going to come in so handy. Did, did you hear what he said? <laughs> Liberia won't need to order any, Francis. <laughs> now, is anyone from my Tierra travel here? No? Okay. They may have been and slipped away. We had about 15 certificates to prepare. And Brian Parkinson has one. And somehow it slipped out of my pile here. So I will get it for you this week, because it's made. I'm so sorry, but he's away, so he won't know. <laughs> well, on behalf of Corley Benoist Science Foundation, on behalf of BC Council of International uh, Cooperation, uh, we want to thank you for being here. We have a reception upstairs, please. I baked like for hours yesterday morning, so go on up and help yourself. Take something home, and there's lots of uh, water and coffee and chat for a few minutes with Francis and Derek. And uh, Derek, I haven't set it up. Is it set up? Oh, he's the best vice president. <laughs> so just head up the stairwell, and, and you'll, you'll find everything. Okay. okay, thank you, everyone.